Existence is only real when it is conscious to somebody. That is why the creator, God, needs conscious man, even though from sheer unconsciousness, he would like to prevent him from becoming conscious. I'm ahead of the curve, also known as James Bergman. In this book review, I will be discussing Carl Jung's Answer to Job, first published in 1952. So I actually picked this particular book up just at a random charity shop um, here in the UK. And I saw Young was on the front cover and it wasn't a book that I have been acquainted with before. But as soon as I realised that it was sort of an analysis, a theological philosophical analysis of the story of Job, a story that I find is particularly interesting in the Bible and it has a certain depth. I thought I'd give it a go. I mean, it was very cheap as well. Um, and my copy is also quite old. It's like, yeah, about 60 years old or something like that. So, yeah, pretty cool copy. So I read the story of Job in the Bible before reading this book. And, you know, just to get myself more acquainted with the story. And I found that when I was reading the um, actual story I had a lot of issues, right, with the nature of God. You know, why did God even make a deal with the devil in the first place? That seems very just you know, arbitrary for a God to even just decide to do that. Um, very humanistic in that sense. Very childish. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I still have that issue, but it, it felt like the majority of my issues that I had, moral issues with God's behaviour um, in the story of Job, everything being taken away from him, and God being surprised that Job is blaming God because God is obviously or apparently the arbiter of uh, everything uh, that happens to everyone. And so Job, as the story goes, he blames God. He starts throwing out insults and you know asks God, why would he do this? Why would he make him suffer like this? I mean, his, I believe like two of his children died. Um, it, all his crops were destroyed. He was on the verge of starvation. He had a seemingly successful life until this uh, hit him. And then God sort of comes down to him and they have this dialogue, which is really interesting. And the thing is, and I don't think I've heard this a lot from people who have talked about this book, but it seems to me that answer to Job is more answer to God, because it feels like what God said and what God did to Job reflects more upon himself, God, than it does Job. And I feel that this story in the Bible is predicated on the nature of God and how, according to Young in this book, which is what made me realise, is that, yes, the, 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 the meaning of this story is to not necessarily question God because you're unaware of his plans, uh, which is obviously a very dubious uh, idea in the first place. I, I'm not really a big fan of the whole God works in mysterious ways. I think that is a bit of an intellectual cop-out. But at the same time, I think there is some element of truth to that, because who is to say we should understand a transcendent entity and, and its and its motives for us? So I see both sides of the coin, but I'm not I'm not really convinced that it's a good uh, argument, really. It's, it's more intuitively reasonable, which I suppose theism does uh, rely on intuition to sort of convince you more than empiricism, which, as Jung also says in the book, you know, theology shouldn't be considered to be an empirical idea or approach. It's much more in tune with the psyche and archetypes and understanding how we feel instead of what we think we feel, you know, in the sense that we're measuring what we feel. Jung would argue, and he does throughout the book, that there is a certain dismissal towards how we feel and there's a certain dismissal towards intuition and therefore we, we lack being in tune with ourselves now that we're becoming more and more you know concerned with scientism um and i've said before that even though i'm currently an agnostic atheist i don't think that the only mode of truth is through empiricism i think that empiricism is consistent and it's reliable but that doesn't mean that it's the um, the 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 only means of understanding reality or or truth. And moreover, 
there are things that we can't empirically measure that we take for granted all the time. What about love? We can't we can't empirically measure that. You know, it, it, it's intuition. And so, you know, someone like Dawkins, he, he never actually answers the point of like, you know, how do you explain love? He, he doesn't explain that. Yes, you could go the whole Rick and Morty route and say that, well, it's just uh, a chemical reaction to help us breed. OK, look, if you want to have that biological stance, then fair enough. And I don't think any theologian would disagree there. But we all know that there's more to love than that, right? We all know that. And so Dawkins doesn't really account for, for this. And because it doesn't it doesn't confirm with his worldview or or his limited worldview of just scientism, um, he, he dismisses that, right? And so I just find that to be a double standard. It, and, and also just it's 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 um it's betraying, I suppose, critical thinking. Because as I said, Scientism, empiricism, yes, it's consistent, but not for everything. And that's the entire point. So keeping on this idea of empiricism and intuition, I want to read out a quote that is a bit lengthy, but I feel that you will probably find it interesting. And I'll have the quote up on screen as well. So yeah, I'll read it out now. The physical is not the only criterion of truth. There are also psychic truths, which can neither be explained nor proved nor contested in any physical way. Religious statements are of this type. They refer without exception to things that cannot be established as physical facts. If they did not do this, they would inevitably fall into the category of the natural sciences. Taken as referring to anything physical, they make no sense whatsoever and science would dismiss them as non-experienceable. They would be mere miracles, which are sufficiently exposed to doubt as it is, and yet at the same time they could not demonstrate the reality of the spirit or meaning that underlies them. Because meaning is something that always demonstrates itself and is experienced on its own merits. The psyche is an autonomous factor and religious statements are psychic confessions, which in the last resort are based on unconscious, i.e. transcendental, processes. These processes are not accessible to physical perception, but demonstrate their existence through the confessions of the psyche. So I know what many of my atheist viewers may be thinking. That's a word salad. <laughs> Uh, that is just conjecture. There's no real grounding for even demonstrating that any of that is even valid. And I'd say maybe, maybe. But I think, again, like I was going back to, Young has a point in the sense that we can't demonstrate certain things, yet we take them for granted. I would have to agree with the many theologians who have mentioned, such as Pascal, that most of our life is a leap of faith. Kierkegaard wrote this himself. We don't cross the street knowing the exact mathematical probability of getting run over, right? We, we have to embody a certain amount of faith in order to live in every single second. We have to assume that we're not going to get bombed or you know, that, that we're not going to get murdered, right? And so there, there is a sense of faith in everything that we do. And what science tries to do, I hear you saying, is making that probability more known to us. And fair enough. But of course, we can't really do that for everything. We can't measure the intricate chemical reactions in our brain. And then, of course, you could say, well, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, um, uh, uh, ignorance, that's a gap in our knowledge, therefore God. And I don't, I don't think that. I think that you, you can't obviously prove God from that, and I would never try to. However, it is something that we should ponder. We should not be so certain that scientism is the only truth. We should not be so certain that reality is what it seems. Of course, science helps us, as I have mentioned. We have consistent empiricism for certain things, but once more. If we apply this approach to everything, we won't necessarily get very far in our quest for truth because we are trying to measure something 
um, in the same regard as an apple is different from an orange, even though they would appear very similar if you were to feel them and close your eyes, right? And so we have to remember that, yeah, we, we shouldn't be so certain of things because even consciousness, I mean, 99% of our processing is unconscious. That is a demonstrable axiom of why most of our actions are based on faith, right? And so I would really want to just hammer this in. And I think that this is Young's central point throughout is that, yes, the answer to Job, th this is obviously about Job and, and the story. But I think that when he was talking more about this whole uh, you know, reason versus faith or science versus faith more uh, better said, I, I did really find that his arguments there were very, very strong. Um, but for fear of digressing too far and for fear of boring you, um, I won't go any further into that particular point. Another central idea in this book is that God, in some sense, can't feel what it is like to be his creation. And so, in a sense, he doesn't actually understand what it is to feel suffering and pain. And then Young links this back to Jesus Christ in saying that this was God's attempt in embodying man and understanding the suffering of his creation. And obviously, this is not a new idea, but this was <clears throat> new to me in the sense that Young explained it very, very well and very clearly. And I feel that there is some, again, that intuitively there is some merit to that. It's like, hypothetically, a metaphysical being could not, obviously, <laughs> um, understand what it is to be a, 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 a being such as us. A decaying, always dying, crippled mess of a biological organism, right? God by definition, is not that, and nor can he be that um, on command. He has to create something else, which is a son, hypothetically, of uh, you know Jesus, right? And so that was the only way he could understand suffering. And obviously, Christianity is predicated on Jesus. And there is a particular quote that I will get now, which I find, I found um, rather interesting. Existence is only real when it is conscious to somebody. That is why the creator, God, needs conscious man, even though from sheer unconsciousness, he would like to prevent him from being conscious. If there is nothing to experience existence, then what is the value of that realm where existence can uh, abode, right? And so even if, hypothetically, God knows what the pain and the suffering and, and, the, and the torment, even though he's aware of what it means to live as a human, what it means to live as a mortal. And, and th this, is, this is where it gets a bit more rocky, but, but I want to put the idea forward anyway. He's allowing us to exist because without us to exist in this realm, the realm will be arbitrary. And Jung even said about the point of God being lonely for so long. <laughs> Again, I, the, the, the merit of this is still not decided within myself, but I want to obviously share the ideas. Um, but he's saying that God must have felt very lonely um, as a metaphysical being, not ever understanding what it is to be his own creation. Therefore, he... Uh, became Christ, or however which way you want to translate that. So in a sense, he needs us more than we need him. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I don't know how many theologians will take this idea, how far they will run with it, and maybe I've misconstrued Jung's idea, and if I have, uh, do let me know. But all of these ideas are hypothetically, intuitively reasonable, I suppose, but whether I'd philosophically agree with them or, or say that they have definite merit? I'm not sure. But what I liked about this book as I was reading 
is not only the writing style of Young is, is very poetic at times, he's very articulate about how much space he has to write his ideas. And chapters are very short in this piece as well. A certain chapter might mention the Egyptian gods and how uh, they, apparently to him, predicted the uh, monotheistic um, god and how also that god needs his creation and a son of some sorts. And it, it's an interesting link. Again, I need to look more into that idea. But Young is drawing so many different strings to one another, and sometimes it's so overwhelming that you have to sort of sit back and be like, wow, th these ideas are pretty interesting. And regardless of whether you think they have merit in them, I was really, really enjoying reading the book. I mean, the, the first few chapters are predicated on Job's story, explaining it, and maybe even justifying God's uh, decision-making. And I utterly loved the, the first section of the book, the first few chapters. After that, it goes more into, as I said, faith and reason, science. Um, and then it goes a bit more in depth about the Egyptian gods, as I've mentioned, and a bit more on paganism. And I, whilst I didn't enjoy those sections as much, they're so short as sections that I could forgive the book for not being as, let's say, interesting. But of course, that is just down to personal preference. So, but the thing is that I'm trying to get across is, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this book. I, I felt that it was very articulate, as I said, and Young was just pulling so many strings together. And I really did enjoy this more than the other book that I reviewed by him a few months ago, which was Man's Search for a Soul, I believe. That book was interesting, but I found that a lot of it was verging on the woo-woo side of things, uh, verging a bit too far into conjecture. And of course, you could claim the same for this book, and you could claim the same for theology in general, but when Jung uses really great philosophical arguments in certain sections, I'm like, well, okay, I can't, I can't just let this go. <laughs> I need to think about this. And so, yeah, this book is full of a lot of things that I'm not really sure about. It's full of things that I feel answered my issues with God's character in the Job story. And so I, I think that this book is perfect for anybody who enjoys the Job story or the Bible or, you know, philosophy, theology. I think that this is a really good book overall. And Young's ability to justify things philosophically and, and um, you know, logically, they're, they're just, they're very, very sophisticated. His ideas are very sophisticated. And it also felt to me as well that he was a much more <laughs> well-spoken writer um, or thinker than Jordan Peterson. He's, it's like, I, I've heard this before, it's like people say that um, Carl Jung is a, is a glorified uh, Jordan Peterson. And I must agree in some sense, because Carl Jung a lot of the time was saying, or, or at least touching on some of the ideas that Jordan Peterson has before. But I feel that, personally, Jordan Peterson is just too vague. He doesn't really understand what he's even saying half the time when he talks about God. Um, it's either it's recycled or it's just so vague you can't actually draw any rational conclusion from it. It's just in the mist, it's in the wind. But I feel that Jung articulated, I'm using that word quite a lot, but he articulated his ideas in the same way that Peterson tries to, but like so much better, so much clearer. And so if you are interested in questioning the transcendent and thinking about this kind of idea, then Jung, again, Jung's uh, translation of these ideas is just, is just really, really good. I, I did enjoy that quite a bit. I also want to add that Jung uses the word empirical in a certain way that it doesn't rub me the wrong way necessarily, but I'm, I feel that maybe he's misattributing what it means to be empirical. And I'm going to read out this quote in a minute, but Jung, just as a preface, he's to me equating the word empirical with something that is consistently intuitively observable. 
And as we know from empiricism, it, it, empiricism is not just what is consistently observable, but it's also something that can be measured, right? And this goes back to what I said about, well, how far do we run with something that is consistently observable, but not measurable? And then the question is, well, what do you mean by measurable? Because in a sense, you could say, well, a thought is measurable in the sense that you know that you've had one. But obviously, a skeptic will say to that, well, you can't trust your thoughts. We have no free will. So I want to put all of that out there before I read this out and, and just maybe cause some sort of conversation in the comments, because I feel that this review, um, I, I, I'm wanting maybe a discussion, perhaps, and, and anyone who's read this piece, um, your interpretation of the book. But yeah, I, I'm just putting a lot of ideas out there because in my mind, I'm still trying to work them out. But uh, yeah, I'm going to stop stalling and I'll read out the quote. Enlightenment operates with an inadequate, rationalistic concept of truth and points triumphantly to the fact that beliefs are all moonshine. Agnosticism maintains that it does not possess any knowledge of God or of anything metaphysical, overlooking the fact that one never possesses a metaphysical belief, but is possessed by it. Both are possessed by reason, which represents the supreme arbiter who cannot be argued with. But who or what is this reason, and why should it be supreme? Is not something that is and has real existence for us an authority superior to any rational judgment, as has been shown over and over in the history of the human mind? Unfortunately, the defenders of faith operate with the same futile arguments, only the other way about. The only thing which is beyond doubt is that there are metaphysical statements which are asserted or denied with considerable effect precisely because of their numiosity. This fact gives us a sure empirical basis from which to proceed. So as I've just read out, Young is appealing to a kind of empiricism, but one that is not mathematically objective, but one that is intuitively objective. And again, I must stress, we take for granted many things that are intuitively objective. Yet when it comes to certain philosophical arguments, such as for that of God, we turn away and we think it's just uh, worth dismissing entirely. And as many of you will know, I like reading theology and taking the philosophical arguments for and against seriously. And I feel that this is something that needs to be addressed, that maybe we are being too close-minded, maybe we are being too dismissive. Because if we were going to be consistent, we'd have to justify our actions uh, instead of idly you know, taking them for granted, let's say. So yeah, I still have issues with the story of Job in the Bible. I feel that some of God's behaviour was just very childlike, but at the same time, I kind of see the reasoning behind a lot of it, because, as I said, I, I do think that it's maybe an intellectual cop-out to say that, well, you know, God works in mysterious ways, therefore we shouldn't impose our uh, mortal, um, ignorant assumptions about God and compare it, especially to our own culture and our own world, uh, to really label God as a moral monster is, well, it's kind of a circular argument in the sense that if you're an atheist, then you, you can't even ground your morality objectively. So you have to sort of make your own. And I'm not saying that subjective morality doesn't practically work. I personally think it does. But to justify it, that's a different question um, in, in the objective sense. And so what I will put forward is that I kind of get the point of how Job blaming God and Job taking it out on God. And I do think that him comparing his idea of morality, his his human idea of morality and, and pointing the finger at God, I do think that there is an argument to be made there that he can't even do that in his position, right? Because how, I mean, like God says in the story itself, like, 
Were you there at the beginning of creation? Were you there when I created so and so? Were you there when I did all of this? And it's like, well, no. And so how are we to judge something that is naturally beyond our comprehension? We can try, but inevitably we will only fail. But then obviously the question is, well, how much of theology could you just dismiss? Because surely that's using humanistic logic and so on to interpret God. Well, I'd probably say good point. There are just so many dubious things in the Old Testament that are just nearly unforgivable. Like I said, yes, you could make the argument philosophically that you can't judge uh, a metaphysical being and compare it to our own standard of morality. Okay. But then again, why make it so dubious to us? And there's divine hiddenness to consider as well. That's an entirely different argument right there. So yeah, I'm not really sure what else to say in this particular video, only that I really did enjoy this book and it did get me thinking a lot. And it's much better than the other young book that I read, uh, Man's Search for a Soul. And so yeah, if you're interested in the philosophy of theology, um, if, if you also like young, I would highly, highly recommend this. It's not a very long book either. It's, it's just really, really interesting. So thank you for watching this video. I hope that you leave a comment, give me your thoughts on, even if you haven't read the book, it doesn't particularly matter. Just give me your thoughts on what you think of my reasoning here, because I, you know, I'm trying to see both sides of the coin, but at the same time, I realize that one side is obviously more tainted than the other, which is that on theism, hence I'm not a theist. So, yeah, theist, atheist, agnostic, uh, Muslim, Christian, Jew, give me your thoughts on this book and what I've said. So, yeah, I've been Head of the Curve, aka James Bergman. Thank you for watching. Check out my social media in the description below, my Goodreads, my Patreon if you want to donate to me and get some rewards. Um, and also check out the podcast that I do uh, or that I co-host. So, yeah. Once again, thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video.